So in the comments for the Slate 46 episode, several of you have said, hey, can we hear more about Rat Slade, the Rio who became a POW? And that got me thinking, actually, the guy who can talk about the POW experience the best is John Nickel, who was an RAF tornado navigator who was shot down on the first day of the war. So for this episode, John is joining me from his home in England to talk about his experiences as a POW and his new book about those experiences and a lot more called Tornado in the Eye of the Storm. Let's start by talking about the tornado. I've done some operations over the years with tornadoes and it's an incredible airplane. It has a very unique capability uh, that was both an advantage and sort of a liability in the early days of the war in terms of what, what happened coming in low. So tell us about your path to becoming a navigator and the tornado. I joined the Royal Air Force in 1981. Uh, I joined as a uh, what we call them an airman. So I wasn't an officer. So the equivalent of a private soldier or an airman first class or something like that. Uh, I did five years as a, a communications technician. And then I applied for a commission. Um, I wanted to be a pilot, uh, part of the two winged master race, as everybody does. But I, I wasn't good enough. I didn't pass all the tests. But I uh, was uh, selected to be a navigator. Uh, and so I did my nav training, which ooh, two years over here, really, it is. And then ended up on the front line in RAF Germany, out in, the, uh, out in Germany um, in 1989. So at the, the, the Cold War was coming to an end. And so many of us were wondering what was going to happen to us. Uh, and then in uh, 1990, Saddam, invade, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and, uh, and everything changed in our lives. So where did you guys fly out of in the AOR there? Uh, we ended up at Bahrain um, in the north of the island. I think you had one of your marine wings on the, in the south of the island at Sheikh Issa Airport. Uh, or the RAF was based up in the north of the island at the civilian airport. So typical Brits. Uh, sorry, all of the Americans in the south were living in tents and containers. We were living in the five-star hotels in the north of the island, which because that's what we do as bricks, to be perfectly honest. Yes. Um, so we had a big tornado detachment there. We had another big tornado detachment across the causeway in Dahran. And we had a massive tornado detachment right over the other side of the country, in Saudi in Tabuk. So we had, I think in the end, something like, if I remember correctly, maybe 2,000 personnel out there, something like that. No, I mean, our contribution was still minuscule compared to the American contribution, but it was the second biggest contribution in the coalition at the time. I, I actually did a debt out of Al Jabber yeah. in 1995. It was a, a, an F-14 TARPS or reconnaissance yeah. capability detachment. As the ship went around the Arabian Peninsula, um, we flew two planes off and, and operated out of Al Jabber for for a week, actually, supporting Operation Southern Watch. Yes. And yeah. some of the hangars there were still blown up. Yeah. You know, probably your handiwork. Not um, mine. I, listen, I was sure, but my, yeah. my war was over really quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, your your mates. My mates right? Yeah. I, I mean, interestingly, in the, uh, so in the book, I talk about kind of right from the, the very first day when the war, when the conflict started, and the tornado was obviously at the very forefront um, and was there in the first few minutes. So obviously, you had the yeah, F-117s over Baghdad and the, uh, and the uh, attacks down on the, uh, on the radar sites to, to break the door open so we could all get in there. But the tornadoes were there. I think the very first wave of attacks at Talil uh, and uh, Al-Assad, I think, uh, in, the, in the very early hours of the what was it, the 17th? It was the 16th in America, but the, the 17th. So, you know, it was the, the, the tornado was there right at the very start. Yeah. So, again, talk about the tornado yeah. designed to come in low, like real low, 200 mm -hmm. feet kind of low, yeah. and, and 700 and knots kind of fast. So let's yeah. talk about the tornado's capability a little bit. It, it was a Cold War invention. You know, the tornado was designed for the cold, as all of our aircraft were at the time, obviously. Back in the, what, in the 60s, 70s, there was a talk in the Royal Air Force about getting American F-111s. It was cancelled by the, uh, the Labour government uh, of the time. Uh, and in the end, we built the, the tornado was built in conjunction with the Italians, 
and the Germans, the tri it was a tri-national product. Uh, but it was designed for the Cold War. So uh, it was designed to hit Soviet airfields at low level, at night, in cloud and in bad weather. And so we, it had a terrain following radar, very a, a similar system to the F-111. But the terrain following radar in the tornado, you would fly and we practiced this endlessly. Hands off. So the pilots sitting with their hands off, just monitoring the screens. The, the, the guy in the back, navigator, as we called it, Wizzo, as you guys called it. Uh, operating the navigation equipment, updating the kit, the targeting equipment. And it would fly, well, 600 knots uh, at 200 feet, hands off. And it would do that as long, as long as you wanted it to do it. And that was, it was designed to fly at night in bad weather, but it was an immensely stable jet. And so a huge proportion of our training was also, also low level daytime visual flying. And in the Gulf uh, so my raid, my op, was the first daylight attack of the war, uh, the Brit attack. And we were flying probably 20 to 30 feet uh, and maybe 5, 40, 600 knots, that kind of thing. I mean, you wouldn't do that for an hour because you just run out of gas. But, you know, you could there's certainly, and you know, I've described a couple of occasions in the book where people are running in towards the target, either at 30 feet and 5, 50, 600 knots, daylight, looking at where they're going. Uh, or at night, 200 feet, um, and, you know, on occasions, 550, 600 knots. Is what? Well, this is, this is January 17th, right? you said, yeah. first, yes. first yeah. day of the war. Yeah. Um, and so I'll remind my viewers that we've, we also talked to Mongo about his MIG kill on the first day of the war. Yes, yeah. Um, so, so busy times. And so you launch out of the base in Kuwait, and again, what was your target? Uh, we were going into Al Ramalia South uh, South South West Air Base, which we, we had. Be, intelligence told us, you know, intelligence, yeah, lies in the forest. <laughs> intelligence told us it was a it was basically a, a dispersed operating base. There were no defenses there and no air assets, and we were going to interdict the uh, the operating services. We were going to. Uh, we called it loft bombing. You guys would have, ref your mud movers would have called it toss bombing because uh, it was daylight. We didn't want to go over the airfield. We were toss bombing thousand pounders just it, because the tornado then had a very limited uh, precision guided capability and none of us had it at the time out there. It came in quite quickly. So we were lofting thousand pounders uh, onto Aramalia Southwest. Um, didn't quite work like that in the end. So the cover shows you kind of doing a runway cutting kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that, is that. So what that's what they, doing? so I went at, I think about seven o'clock in the morning of the 17th, but you know, for, to remind people, the conflict started in the region at about midnight local time. Um, uh, so at two o'clock in the morning, local time in the region. So it was two o'clock in the morning on the 17th. Of January, so the first assets went in to hit the radar stations, and then the stealths went in over Baghdad, and then all the mud movers went in to hit multiple airfield targets, multiple uh, chemical weapons establishments, multiple uh, command and control establishments. And I think in the first twenty-four hours, I think there's something like two thousand uh, uh, combat sorties launched. So that first wave was at night. So that's what the cover of the book depicts it depicts the tornado going across the runway dropping the jp233 which was our runway busting weapon so it uh it's, it was like carrying two massive concrete suitcases and you know it was just having like having two air brakes out permanently um but it deployed these massive cratering munitions that punched through the concrete buried themselves and exploded and heaved the uh, runway up and then it deployed hundreds of uh, anti-personnel munitions as well. And so you put eight jets over an airfield and you're putting hundreds of cratering munitions and thousands of anti-personnel mines to try to, um, to basically deny the Iraqi Air Force the use of its airfields because, and people forget this now, the Iraqi Air Force was massive and we were really worried. Not one person in that coalition thought that the Iraqi Air Force was anything other than a huge threat, a massive threat. They were combat proven in Iran. They had um, modern fighters, mirages, MiGs. Uh, and we were really fearful 
of the Iraqi Air Force. In actual fact, as you know, the Iraqi Air Force didn't get off the ground that much. And when they did, they were largely shot down, mostly by, uh, by the American F-15 assets. Um, or, they flew, or they flew to Iran. Or, or the, yeah, so that's what was it, 100 took off and, and scarped into uh, Iran. Yeah. Um, but what we, had, what we did not understand, because nobody had ever faced it before since Vietnam, and even then I don't think it was quite the same as the concentration of fire that we faced, was the, the ground defences. So we had, you, you know, we had uh, countermeasures for missile systems. We had chaff and we had flares. We had uh, electronic countermeasure pods, which could jam missile systems. What nobody knew until the first moment as they approached the airfields at high speed and low level was what the AAA, the anti-aircraft fire was going to be like. And uh, uh, describing the book, and one of the guys says, they're, they're, they're motoring along at 200 feet and... 500 knots, eight aircraft, so flying in formation, but you can't see anybody. So you're two miles separated, and there's another two behind you, and another two behind you, and another two behind you, totally blind to everybody because it's pitch black. And one of the guys says, who's leading the very first operation, he said he looked over in his left 10 o'clock, and he said there was a glow on the horizon, sparkling lights. And as they got a bit closer, he could see out in his left. He said, oh, my God, that is... Triple A over an airfield. And he said it was like looking at uh, a dome, an inverted dome, a, a funnel of exploding fire. Um, and, he, and he said to his guy in the back seat, he said, thank God we're not going there. Somebody's being going to be hit hard. And because the tornado flies on autopilot, as he said that, the jets all went <laughs> and pointed at this. And his nav said, that's our target, mate. And he said it was like flying into a shower. You know, you're in a shower and everything is, the droplets are around you. He said it was like that, but there were exploding droplets and you couldn't do anything. You just had to go as low and as fast as you could. And certainly on the first day, and one of the guys in the book talks about this, he actually took the terrain following radar system out and flew the aircraft blind below 100 feet at night. Simply rely in the tornado. If you we've got a rad alt, a radar altimeter, and it reads very accurately to a hundred feet. And at a hundred feet, if you go a hundred feet below that, it unlocks and goes blank. And so he said, I flew it down until it unlocked. So I knew I was beneath a hundred feet, and then I just kept the wings level. And he said he flew in blind at night into the AAA at beneath a hundred feet. That's crazy to think about. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, John, so AAA, small arms fire, SAMs, yeah. IR SAMs, shoulder fired, man pads. Th yeah. These are what the Tornado, like the B-1, like the A-6, like the Harrier, were not designed to go against. As you said at the outset, generally I mean, the, the tactic was terrain the, following to evade SA-2 threat against SA2, the Soviets. SA-3, SA-6, SA-8. I mean, right, it right. was designed, you know, we had, so we had chaff and flares and we were, you know, the idea was flying so low that, you know, heat seeking missiles, et cetera, couldn't kind of lock onto you. But so we were then in the daylight the next day uh, and we were coming off target after a miserable attack that failed. Um, uh, and we were, myself and my pilot, John Peters, were flying at about, I'm going to hazard a guess, maybe 20 to 30 feet, 540 knots. Uh, and, and back then we didn't have any auto... Uh, IR missile detection systems then, we didn't have anything like that. So the only re the only way you would deploy flares to counter an IR missile would be as if you saw it coming towards you. And we just didn't see it. And this, we were flying along at kind of, I don't know, 25, 30 feet. And suddenly the jet simply, it was like being hit by an express train out of nowhere, came from the rear right five o'clock straight into the right hand engine and it just the jet just went so we are flying along looking up a blue sky 25 feet the aircraft's tipped it's tumbling and instead of flying along we're flying sideways and it's and i'm still looking up but there's no blue sky anymore i'm looking up at brown sand uh and we i mean luckily jp my pilot managed to get control of the aircraft uh uh but we, so he managed to get us away from the ground and we started to limp back. But the right hand engine was on fire. 
uh, all of the flyby way systems were down. Almost every electrical system had gone. Uh, the, the cockpit warning panel was lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, and basically, we're, we're flying a burning torch. And it was a ball of flame. And it was marching steadily to where I sit in the rear seat of the cockpit. Uh, so you guys are coming off target, right? Yeah. This happened. You, you'd already delivered your ordinance. No, we hadn't. I mean, the, 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 the attack hadn't they'd failed because there'd been a cock up in the cockpit, my cock up almost certainly. So we were talking about, because this was our very first wartime operational sortie, and okay. we cocked it up. And so we were saying, oh, my God. We talked about, shall we go around again and try and re-attack? Can you, in daylight? We were, we were trying to rescue our reputations, really. Uh, and so, so, you know, we, dis we dumped the weapons and ran. Uh, and, uh, and so that's when we were hit, about maybe three minutes off the target, two minutes off the target. So when you talk about cocked it up, specifically, was this a switchology thing? Was it a yeah. I mean, uh, almost, uh, What happened uh, there? Um, the, the, the sequence of um, continuing the attack or committing the attack there's a there's a sequence of button pressing that you have to go through in the rear seat. It's not you know it, it's anybody who you wouldn't design anything like this now. It was from the 1970s, but and we've done it hundreds, thousands of times. And if you don't press the buttons in the right one for <laughs> sequence, uh, then it it doesn't go the, the the you don't get the symbology, you don't get the HUD symbology to pull up properly. And it just so it was almost certainly that. But you know that's my my uh, my bad to be perfectly honest. Well, but people need to appreciate the environment in which you're operating, right? I yeah, mean, that doesn't matter much. That's what combat. we're trained to do. That's what yeah. we're trained to do. You know, I you know, shouldn't still, get this When it's for real, it makes all the difference. Yeah, yeah well, you so still shouldn't get this crap wrong. <laughs> yeah, so so you're looking in the rearview mirror. The airplane's on fire. John calls for ejection. Or how did you guys get out? Uh, no, I mean, at first, we're trying to get back uh, somewhere near the border. But this fire is getting close. And in the end, I say, look, right, we've got to get out. We've got to get out now. Uh, and so I broadcast our position to AWACS uh, where we were and that we were rejecting. And then we uh, we had to uh, rely on the good old Martin Baker instant letdown system. A British uh, company. Sorry, British say. company. Seats that is, of course, uh, the U.S. Navy had the Martin Baker seat. So you had the, the Martin Baker seat in the uh, Tomcat. Yes. Uh, Big fan of the Martin Baker. Oh, hey. <laughs> I'm a massive fan. Of yeah, you're even a bigger fan than I am. Yeah, yeah. I'm an even bigger fan. Uh, so, you, you know, you just pull the handle and, uh, you know, you sit on this damn thing for years and years and years and years and people stand on it and people kick it and it gets sandy and it gets dusty and it gets wet and it gets cold and it gets snowy. And then at some point you have to pull that handle and hope that whoever built that seat 10 years ago Whoever dusted it down and cleaned it up did it all properly and that it all works. And it did, you know, pull the handle. Uh, the cockpit disappeared. Uh, I, it obviously, you know, it happens so fast. I think in the we were sitting on a Mark 10 seat. So from pulling the handle to being in the parachute, I think is about 1.5 seconds, something like that. And so all I remember is pulling the handle, a massive, almost a, a whoosh. And I remember seeing flames coming out my backside as the, as the seat went up the rails and came out. And then the next thing is just kind of almost tumbling and then a, 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 a jolt as the parachute opened and I'm hanging in the parachute. I could see the jet flying over there, still flying. Um, uh, it crashed about, I don't know, a few seconds later. So about uh, what airspeed and altitude did you punch uh, well, out? We, well, because we'd had time, so, you know, uh, we banged out. I think it's something like we pulled up uh, an emergency pull up, maybe 300 feet and maybe 200, maybe 300, 400 knots, something like that. I can't remember. Okay. Um, so we were in really, we were in good, a good position. Right. Not some scary fast, fast, not 700 not, knots. Not, I mean, right. one, of the, the, one of the guys I interviewed, a great friend of mine, we ended up as prisoners together. He banged out at 600 knots and 200 feet at night. Uh, and he didn't know. His navigator, his backseat had banged them out because they were hit by a Roland missile. All he can remember is everything going black and thinking he was dead. Uh, and then he woke up in the desert near to Talil. Uh, he dislocated both his shoulders. He had massive uh, MDC splatter all over his face, perspex in his face. His navigator, they both blacked out. If you come out, it's 600 knots or 580 knots. You know, you're, that's like being hit by a 700 mile an hour wind.
Absolutely. Like being hit in the face with a, a sledgehammer. So it sounds like the tornado ejection sequence is like the Tomcat in that single clamshell canopy. Canopy comes off. You're not punching out through the canopy like a Harrier. No. So canopy comes off. Navigator goes. Pilot goes. Yeah, exa exactly that. Exactly that. Um, and, you know, so we land, JP and I landed in the desert and uh, and that's when the fun started. Well, I mean, how did you get captured? What, what happened once you got on deck? Well... We were on. I know that you spoke to. Uh, you did that. You did about uh, Rat and Boots's sortie, where they were kind of running around the desert. Right. Uh, we were doing the same, but we didn't have any air assets. Nobody really knew we'd come out. We, they knew we were missing, but this was daylight, and so they weren't going to stop on the first hours of the war. So, and roughly, were, what part of the country are you? Because uh, Boots, Boots and Rat are sort of west of yeah, Baghdad, yeah, yeah. right up north. We're right. down southeast, probably. Kind of forty miles uh, east of uh, Basra. Basra. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, kind of south east of Talil. Okay. Uh, in right. that kind of area where there's a huge, you know, there must have been about ten massive Iraqi air bases. Okay. Okay. So we were we were on the run, I reckon, for about three hours, but it's bright sunshine, half past nine in the morning by then, and there's a crash tornado in the desert and. Uh, and we were leaving big sandy footprints. And you guys are together, unlike Boots yeah, and yeah, Rat. We you no, guys are together. No, no, we were we were together. You know, because it was yeah. daylight, and so we came down. We come out the aircraft, you know, within whatever it was, a quarter of a second of each other. So John must have been, I don't know, fifty, a hundred yards away from me, something like that. So we got together and we set off. But you know, we we, we knew we were being followed. And after I think probably three hours, the just shots rang out. Uh, and then we kind of just through the heat haze, I don't know what it was, maybe a dozen Iraqi, uh, the probably airmen from the local airbase, actually, conscripts. They're just all uh, AK-47 assault rifles and they're shooting and they're shooting a lot and they're shooting at us. It's like being in a middle of a Western cowboy movie, to be honest. Well, and so to that point, you guys had a little conversation like, should we like, is this it? Should we go, you know, Butch and Sundance here? Right, yeah. you guys had sidearms, right? And yeah, and, yeah. Uh, we, we, we had sidearms. Um, we had, you know, in the run up to the conflict, obviously, you know, there'd been all the rumors that you know Saddam Hussein had said we'd be given to the civilians and torn limb from limb. And JP and I had a very real conversation about, right, you know, do we want to be captured? And as they were coming over the sand dune towards us, I, you know, we both had our. I mean, they were pathetic little Walther PP pistols, uh, to be perfectly honest, but nothing like the massive big flipping 45s that your lads carried. Um, but I turned to John and said, shall we go out with a bang? And so I was saying to him, right, let's get up. Let's charge towards them, try and kill a couple of them. And then we'll be killed, obviously. And then it'll be all over. Uh, and luckily, JP said, "This is it." We can see this is a ridiculous idea. He said, "No, mate. There's always hope," and I still remember that today. Uh, and there was, you know, and so we were captured. Uh, immediately, they started kicking seven bells out of us, and I thought we were going to be killed at that point uh, because they were out of control. Which you can kind of understand if there's a massive air attack on your country. You know, you can absolutely understand their rage and their infuriation. Uh, but I thought we were going to be killed then. But they had an officer appear and got them under control. And we were bundled into a vehicle, taken off, I think, to probably Shaiba, which became one of the main operating bases after Gulf War II for the Allies. And then we were shipped via a couple of different places uh, and you know, ended up in Baghdad that night. Well, let's just note that had you guys taken your way, the book would have been very short. The book would have, right. it would have been yeah. the most boring book in the world. No, it would have been no, it'd be a great ending. Yeah, yeah. Cinematic, you know, pages. <laughs> it'd be like true grit when John Wayne is, you know, going across the plane there, but it would have been short. Right? Well, I tell you what, looking back now, 30 was it 30, is it 31 years? 30 years. Uh nearly 31 years. I kind of I can still remember it as clear as day. But you know, I don't know, were we brave? I don't know. Were we foolish? I, don't, I just, you know, it was just one of those things that you kind of thought of uh, what you were going through every option in your head. I mean, we knew it was going to get bad when we were captured and it did. It got really bad, but I, it didn't get as bad as it could have. You know, I've, I've just been speaking to a couple of Vietnam veterans uh, who were prisoners for five and a half years. And that was bad. That was 
the 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 pain and the degradation and the horror and the fear that they went through is unimaginable and our seven weeks of captivity whilst mildly annoying and somewhat hurty at times just pales in insignificance compared to the vietnam vets well okay i roger that but let's talk about your experience yeah. in captivity yeah um and uh how that how that went down um, well, I think, I mean, first of all, we knew that we were going to give in. That's the bottom line. Uh, there was a sense of foolish personal pride that said you didn't want to give in without a fight, even though you knew it was a, a pointless experience because you were going to give in, whether it was after an hour or a, uh, a day or a week in some of our special forces guys' cases. They actually kind of, you know, held out for best part of a week, two weeks, and gave little away in the end. But we knew. And so, again, it was bad, but in retrospect, it could have been a lot worse. So, you know, it was that classic, you've been through the uh, interrogation training, uh, the good interrogator, the bad interrogator, Mr. Nice, Mr. Nasty, the physical violence, and there was, you know, stress position. So kind of, you know, having your feet a yard away from a wall, but leaning your head against the wall so your body goes into cramp. And every time you move, somebody beats you with a rubber hose. Uh, being kind of held down in a chair and somebody beating you with a club. You know, at one point, kind of somebody stubbing cigarette out on my ears. Uh, and so this kind of went on. I think I kind of lasted, I don't know, two and a half days or something. I can't remember. Um, but that was because in those first two days, there was a lot of people being captured. Uh, a lot, in actual fact. And they kind of didn't really know what they were going to do with everybody. Uh, and so I went through maybe three or four kind of violent interrogations over two or three days. Uh, and in the end, um, they, uh, they set me on fire, which was decidedly unpleasant of them. Um, they kind of they put tissue paper down the back of my neck and set it on fire. And again, whilst it sounds bad, and it was, it, because I kind of managed they. After I started yelling a bit, they put it out. Uh, but it was almost, it's, it was the fear of what are they going to do next? That for me was a very, they, you know, they, so I expect them to be breaking my fingers, pulling my toenails out, uh, pulling my teeth out with pliers. And after they'd set me on fire, I kind of thought, right, hold on. Two days have gone by. You've got no intelligence at all. I mean, and I don't mean my own personal intelligence, which was true, but we've got no intelligence about any attacks. Uh, and it became, I just thought I made a calculated decision. You could be permanently disabled by this, and I'm not sure it's worth it. I, I, felt, I felt intense shame, and I was in tears after I gave in and started telling them what they wanted to know. I was in tears because I felt so ashamed of what I was doing. The only thing I could hold on to was the fact that they didn't know what they wanted to know. They were just brutal, violent interrogators. So they'd say, how heavy is a tornado? I don't bloody well know. I know that I should know, but I don't know. So then they'd beat you a bit more because you didn't know how heavy a tornado was. How fast can it fly? What weapons does it carry? All of these things have been in all of the papers beforehand. So I consoled myself with the thought that they didn't ask me anything that I thought was going to uh, endanger anybody else. Well, you mentioned SEER school, which is the, the yeah, yeah. W training that we all go through. I went uh, in Brunswick in the middle of the winter. <laughs> and one of the takeaways, which is learned by Vietnam era POWs, is what you're talking about, which is the bend, don't break, you know, as, as yeah. they, they call it, don't John Wayne it. Yeah. Uh, because as you suggest, the end state is, is you know, self-evident in terms of physical... Yeah, yeah, it's true. You know, or death, right? So they're like, you know, give them parts of bogus. Right, so, I remember, so, uh, who was it? I think it was uh, Paul Galanti, uh, who I'm still in comms with. Um, he was a battalion officer at the academy when I was there. Uh, said he told them that his father was the uh, a conductor on an HO railroad, you know, a model railroad. And they thought that was awesome information, yeah. right? And they let up once he said that, that kind of thing. I think that there's two things to that, actually, Ward. The first thing is that the rules back then were very specific. There were still almost NATO rules, Cold War rules. The only thing you can do is say your number, rank, name, your date of birth. And one other thing, I cannot answer that question. So they were the rules. Now, they changed in the aftermath of our experience. You know, every combat school 
survival school changed their rules to say, right, we now need to talk about a slow release of material so that you're not going through this because it's pointless. But you've got to be really careful because, you know, you could say something like my dad was a con conductor on a railway or uh, I was on 20 squadron in case I was on 15 squadron. But they're interrogating another 20 people in other rooms around you and your lies can come back and bite you in the arse quite quickly. Uh, and so you just need to be quite careful about that. But definitely they changed from say nothing at all, give them nothing. They changed after that to slow controlled release. Well, then you, but you talk about the, the emotions you felt mm. on the backside of saying anything. Yeah. Uh, you feel like you've let, you know, definitely. the UK I down do. and I the Queen do. and, you know, I mean, no, no, no. so how do you push through that in captivity? Um, I don't think I ever did. And, and interestingly, so I was one of the POWs that was paraded on TV. So from the Americans, the ones that people will remember were uh, Colonel uh, Dave Eberly, who was an F-15E backseater. Uh, uh, a Marine Jeff Zahn Colonel. was on. He was, Jeff Zahn, yeah. uh, A6, I think, was it? A6BN, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Colonel uh, uh, Cliff Acre. Uh, who was a Marine commander. And obviously, uh, you know, the, um, they were the Americans paraded on TV and there were the two Brits, myself and John. I think he was an OV-10 guy, right? OV-10, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. With uh, uh, Warrant Officer Guy Hunter uh, was uh, was with him. Um, and we all ended up in goal together. Uh, well, not together. We were never together, really. Uh, and so... We, well, so I, that, that introduces another question. Were you guys isolated or were you together? Do you have any sense of... The total number of POWs? Yeah. In some, we were held in three or four different places. So we were held with what they kind of equipment of the military police. After the interrogation, which was with a, uh, in one of the big air bases, we were held in kind of their, well, military cells, which were, to all intents and purposes, well, smaller than my office, kind of eight foot by eight foot concrete cell with nothing at all. Uh, but you could hear that there were people along a corridor. So I heard Larry Slade. I know that you know Larry and so of them, Rat. He became a great friend, and we used to whisper at night. Um, Guy Hunter, who was a warrant officer, Marine, um, and uh, Mo Mubarak, who was the Kuwaiti pilot, Skyhawk pilot, who was shot down. So I could hear them, and I could hear occasionally other people. After about 10 days, we were moved from there into the Muhabarat which is the Iraqi Internal Security Service. Uh, and that was bad. And that was in that their massive complex kind of walls, three feet thick, two inch steel doors. And you rarely heard anything and you definitely never saw anything. And then when that was helpfully bombed by the Americans, that prison was bombed and we were nearly killed. And I spoke to one of the stealth pilots involved in that little shenanigans not so long ago. Uh, we were moved to Abu Ghraib which became infamous, of course, after the right. second Right, it had its own, own infamy later, uh, yes. But that was bad. I, and I was, in a, I was in a cell with Larry, with Rat Larry Slade, for I think a day uh, in Abu Ghraib, and that was bad. We, oh my God. We, we were what, what are you eating? Do they, are they feeding you? To, uh, or uh, are, you well, are you getting water? I mean, how's, how's that going? Um, they would normally give you something once a day so kind of depending on what prison you are in you might get a bowl of kind of greasy liquid with a bit of fat in it and a bowl of water once a day when we were in the with a muhabara we got best you know hardly anything a, a bowl of water and a piece of bread once a day for probably four weeks and it was you know it was fantastic in seven weeks as a prisoner of war five weeks as a prisoner of war i think i must have lost what do you, you do i do stone so maybe 30 pounds 35 pounds in seven weeks in five weeks uh, my wife says i should be going back there pretty damn soon <laughs> um, uh, so very little is the is the honest answer but i mean do you did you have toilet facilities or they put uh, like a in your cell or what what what's that all again, about? It, it depended on where you were in the first place they would let there was nothing they would let you out uh to once a day to go into their in pits you know uh, for a to use the pit uh, but basically, if you're a core shot, you just had either pee or whatever in the corner of the cell. Uh, in um, in the Mukhabarat place, some of the cells had holes in the corner, but they were full. 
So you just basically went in the corner of the cell. Uh, so it just depended where you were, to be perfectly honest. But again, you kind of adapt to this stuff quite quickly. Uh, whilst it is degrading and horrible, it's not the end of the world. You know, we were in fear of our lives. And I mean, really, on a couple of occasions, we nearly died, especially when the stealth guys dropped four 2,000 pounders on us in, uh, in Baghdad. Uh, but you just kind of adapt to it. You just adapt to it. So, did you have any sense of the passage of time? What, how, how mm -hmm. long did the days feel? I mean, you've mentioned the total time was seven weeks, but you know, how long did it feel at the time? Um, it felt long, but I, I the passage I, I recorded the passage of time wherever I was with a kind of a, a scraped mark on the wall because you knew that because wherever you were there was normally some sort of light, um, so you knew that. It was the it was morning, it was night, it had got dark, and then it got light again. So you could mark the passage of time. So I knew what date it was all of the time. Um, and it was, do you know what? It was boring a lot of the time. You slept a lot of the time. You know, when I say slept, you, you know, depending on where you were, you just had a, a concrete or a tiled floor. And if you were lucky, a blanket. Sometimes there's a bit of dirty old uh, foam or something. Uh, there were moments of utter and sheer terror especially either when we're being bombed or when you could hear other people screaming and being tortured, especially in some of the more horrendous prisons, Abu Ghraib being a classic example. And you could actually watch it going on. Uh, and Larry and I were kind of caught up in that once. In retrospect, it went slowly. But at the time, I just you just kind of hoping that it'll be over at some point. And the thing is, Ward, you don't know. Well, that's what I'm not going to ask is, did you have any sense of winning and losing? Because obviously stateside, in fact, I was going back through the F-14 training squadron because there was a there was some sense that the war was going to last longer than 100 days. So I was in my second fleet tour in VF-143 about to go on deployment. We got sortied. Uh, but by the time we got there, it was well over. But we're watching, you know, and CNN and the reports and Schwarzkopf and all the gang doing these daily sort of things. So we had a sense as Americans that we were winning, you know, that the integrated air defenses were rolled back and we had dominion and, and, you know, all the other things happening. But did you have any sense of that? In no, you, had, you had no information. You, the only, so you could, the only information that you would ever have is if an Iraqi came in the cell and said, we have uh, killed a thousand of your troops uh, on the front line. Uh, we shot down today 50 of your RAF aircraft. So you had no idea. And certainly, you know, when it was over, uh, when kind of the four, well, the, the war ended on the 28th of February and we were moved quite quickly and released quite quickly because uh, General Schwarzkopf, Storm and Norman, uh, was adamant that what happened in Vietnam was not going to happen on his watch. Uh, he was getting every single missing uh, MIA, KIA uh, accounted for. And he did that immediately. Uh, and so we were released quite quickly, I think, the, the 4th, 5th of March. And my first question was, how many people have been killed? How, where did they use chemical weapons? Because back then they really did have chemical weapons and they had used them. And everybody thought there'd be mass chemical attacks. And when they said, well, I can't remember what the figures were. I mean, they were bad. 200 killed on our, on our side, something like that. Bad, I can't remember. But uh, And never used chemical weapons, lost very few aircraft. And, it, you know, it was almost unbelievable because we just couldn't believe it had been such a, I'm going to say, because it was at the time, a successful combat operation. Yes. You bring up the chemical weapons part. So mop gear was a big part oh. of the training piece. You know, wearing the mop gear, we were certain that this was going to be. We were flying in it. We war. had, we, right. had we, we not the full kit with a, but we were flying in the, uh, the suits ready in case, because we expected when we landed, that some of the airfields might have been hit by chemical uh, armed scuds. So we had on chemical warfare suits, which proved quite interesting when you're being interrogated. Let me tell you that for nothing. Why have you got a chemical warfare suit on? Well, because we think you guys are going to do it. You, you guys, we're not doing because we're going to use them on you. We weren't flying with them, but that proved to be a, a most interesting occasion as well. But yeah, we you were. You mentioned General Schwarzkopf. There's a cool yeah. picture of you with, with. Margaret yeah. Thatcher and, and Norman Schwarzkopf, uh, a great shot after the war, obviously. Uh, so. It was in his book launch here in London. Um, I met him a couple of times. He was there 
uh, to greet us when we landed in Saudi Arabia. The Bey, as he was known, was there at the bottom of the steps to greet every single prisoner of war. And I met him a couple of occasions after that. He was a, a, and he was a great man, a great, great man. You mentioned in the book that a guy in a suit just walks into your cell one day and says, war's over. Um, you can go that's home. That's kind of it, right? Yeah. And it was, it was almost... It's kind of, again, it was kind of surreal. And you don't want to let yourself believe that it's going to happen in case they're kind of messing with your head again. Uh, but kind of you could hear doors being clanked open and people kind of moving outside. And kind of after about an hour, they moved us out into a corridor and there was a big, long line of people. And we all had those yellow POW suits on then. And there was a big, long line. Uh, and I joined the end of the line and we were handed over to the red Crescent, I think it was, rather than the Red Cross. Um, we were uh, shipped off to uh, the Baghdad Novotel, um, waiting for the handover, because we had, I don't know what it was, 10 or 15,000 uh, Iraqi POWs, and we kind of boarded a Red Cross flight from uh, Saddam Hussein International and, uh, and left the country to great cheers, let me tell you that for nothing. Yeah, no doubt. So the, the box score for the tornado... Uh, that you list here uh, is 11 tornadoes lost during Desert Storm. That's a, that's a, I, I don't know, if, is that the most of any type model series? I think it might be. Uh, it, it wasn't, it wasn't during Desert Storm, it was during the uh, the built to training from the August. Oh, okay. And Desert and Shield, Desert Storm. Des Desert Shield, uh, Desert Storm. Okay. 12 air crew killed, three badly yeah. injured, seven taken prisoner. Yeah. So the tornado pretty much had the dubious stats associated with those yeah, kinds of Yeah, I mean, things. again, if you go through the list, there are greater losses in actual fact. You go through the, uh, but in many ways that doesn't matter. But the tornado certainly uh, took some hits. Uh, and it the tornado changed tactics after, I think, four or five days. It went to medium level. And then we flew out laser-guided uh, weapons and uh, precision-guided munitions and aircraft to help target them. Uh, and so things did change. But it, listen, we, you know, we lost a lot. But, and people forget this, and this is really important. If you So I, th I can't remember off the top of my head. You'll have to look up the figures yourself. Uh, but they, they certainly lost two Strike Eagles, which were the most modern aircraft out there. And the fact that they, I think there was one crew killed uh, and one crew captured. Uh, and nobody could believe that they lost a Strike Eagle. They lost certainly uh, a, maybe three or four A6s. They lost helicopters. They obviously lost the one of the MC-130s, which was terrible. Sorry, one of the AC-130s. Um, and so people were going down. It was a shooting war. We expected to lose people. And the fact that we lost so few, whilst those losses hurt, because they were friends of mine, we said, you know, the, the notion that, you know, we took, we lost more than we expected just isn't true. We lost far fewer than we expected. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And as I pointed out in the Slate 46 episode, by day four, when Rat and Boots got shot down, we'd already lost 13 air, airplanes, yeah. including you guys. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you look at that lineup, you know, it, the, as you've said, it's tornadoes, it's Harriers, it's A6s, it's guys coming in low primarily. Well, and that's uh, that's always the case. I, th I Again, you didn't need to look up the figures, but I think there was probably half a dozen A10s lost as well um, in, in amongst that uh, mix as well. You know, it was a bloody dangerous environment. <laughs> well, that's what we forget, right? I mean, what we take for granted, right? That That was the last, you know, I mean, we're all preparing for the next peer conflict yeah, yeah, against yeah. China or whatever. Yeah. But that was the last time pre 9-11 where we had complete dominion against a yeah. asymmetric threat where yeah. we went again, as you said from the outset, a integrated air defense that was sophisticated, an air force that was combat experience, the Iran-Iraq yeah. war. You know, I mean, the Iranians used the Phoenix missile for crying out loud, yeah. you know, yeah. to good yes. effect as a Tomcat yeah. guy, I'm envious, right? So- you know, maybe I it, maybe it overstates to say we forget, but I think at some level we do forget just how robust this threat was, particularly in the was, first, let's just say, it week was massive. of the war. You know, the, right? if you look at the, the combat lineup of the Iraqi forces, I think it was the um, I, I think it was the third largest standing army in the world, the th fourth or fifth largest air force. It was massive, and we we expected 
huge losses. We had so many um, combat replacement casualty uh, people ready to fly out battle casualty replacements lined up in the UK that weren't used. We expected so many more casualties, which is no comfort to those who lost their lives and their loved ones. But, you know, this was a massive, massive campaign fought brilliantly, planned brilliantly by the likes of uh, uh, General Chuck Horner, uh, General Schwarzkopf, obviously, uh, in the headquarters. And it kind of worked. And General Powell, who just passed away. General Powell, I know, very well. Every year, all the prisoners of war, uh, the Brits get together every year for a, we have one quiet beer of celebration. And then we round that off with about 15 quite loud beers of celebration. Uh, (laughs) And on the 10th anniversary, uh, what's that now, 20, uh, 15 years ago, we all flew over to uh, America, to Washington, and we got together with uh, with all the American prisoners of war. And on the 25th anniversary, six years ago, all the Americans flew over to London uh, and we went to the Royal Air Force Club, which was our private members uh, officers club in, uh, in London. And we had the best weekend ever. Uh, we drank, we went to a military club and drank them dry on the Friday night, literally drank them dry. And on the Saturday night, we had 150 people with our friends and relatives for a big formal dinner with the Royal Air Force Band. Uh, Sir John Major, our Prime Minister at the time, came as our guest of honour and spoke to everybody. General Powell sent us a letter, um, uh, you know, talking about how he felt. Um, uh, uh, President Bush also sent us a letter, um, you know, thanking us. And to see these people uh, acknowledging the sacrifice, yes, of the prisoners of war, but uh, everybody overall, was um, was gratifying, especially from uh, General Powell and, uh, and President Bush, in actual fact. Well, you also met Princess Di. When you, yeah. uh, when you use this Martin Baker seat, you get a tie. <laughs> you get a tie uh, and a, a little pin. And depending on what you're doing and where you are. So this was back in 91. We went to the Martin Baker factory. And uh, Princess Diana, God rest her soul, presented us uh, with our ties then in a, a formal ceremony. Uh, yeah, listen, we, hey, getting shot down and beaten up wasn't that bad. We got to meet some amazing people and do some amazing things. There are probably easier paths to that. Well. To that one, but. So the book is called Tornado in the Eye of the Storm. Yeah. Our guest has been John Nickel. John, thank you for the time. Cheers, much. And uh, very much Enjoy. appreciate uh you know, your service and, and uh, the fact well, that you're putting it down, you know, you finish, uh, in, in I've way. got to show you, I've got to show you my final bit of memorabilia. No, let's see it. So I can't, is that, can you see well, that? Let me, let me get you on the solo layout. Ah, there yeah. we go. Right. So, uh, th- so this is, let me get the, uh, let me get the shine off it. You can't, ah, there we go. This is the pito tube from my aircraft. So, at the end of the war, we sent in a lot of special forces guys to the various crash sites to find, to see, to get the cockpit voice recorder and ADR, uh, accident data recorder, uh, and to obviously see who was alive and who was dead. And one of them kindly brought the pito probe from our aircraft back, and this is now mounted on a chunk of wood in my office. Fantastic. All right, you're a busy man, John. Thanks very much for the time. Hey. And let's let's keep in touch. Good to see you. Thanks for you. All the best, mate. Look after yourself. Okay. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. Once again, thanks to John Nickel for joining me. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber. Give me the likes and comment. Check the links below for merch, including where you can get my first three novels, the Punks Trilogy, just reissued by the Naval Institute Press. And if you're buying the book at usni.org, which I recommend, use the discount code PUNK. YT at checkout and you get 25% off. Special deal for the holidays. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. I appreciate all the support I can get. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.